All right, I'm gonna see if I can, they said it might take four minutes, four seconds for this to go on. I'm gonna see if I can move around a little bit. I noticed nobody wants to sit here, so I might move around. Uh, great to be here at the second largest uh, university in Georgia. And uh, I've been here before for a couple of seminars at the Ward Elm School and, and the other school. It's great to be here to see people all across campus doing environmental work. I think Georgia State, we, we stretch the definition of environment. We probably have about a dozen faculty uh, doing it here, so it's a lot more impressive to be here with uh, so many interesting things that would come from fashion down to soil to the communications and rhetoric and philosophy. Uh, it's great to see all that activity. I know it's 4 o'clock on a Friday, you've been sitting in the, uh, the room all day listening to seminars. I feel like I should have brought some more theatrics with me. Uh, cans for t-shirts or a laser show or something, Chippendale dancers. Maybe, maybe midway I can use this laser pointer and sing some Led Zeppelin, maybe that would help. So, but all I can bring is my passion for this particular topic. Uh, about evidence-based policy and, and the, the dearth of evidence that we have. I'm trying to infect some of you with this passion. We need a lot more people doing this work, generating credible, credible empirical evidence about what works for environmental policies and programs, under what conditions, what moderates these effects, what are the mechanisms. Uh, and sometimes my passion gets a little zealous, but it's good for an afternoon presentation if I provoke you. Uh, and I'm happy to have a conversation both immediately afterward and during the, uh, the reception about this. But the first thing I want to do is make sure everybody's framed correctly about what I mean by evidence. I, I, when people think about evidence particularly, let me just get a sense of the audience. How many people are natural, consider themselves natural scientists? Biology, uh, ecology, okay. How many people physical uh, science? Oceanography, soils, hydrology, a few people. Economists, we have any economists? All right, we have some economists. You're not persecuted on this campus. That's great to see. It's a safe place for economists. It's good. And engineers. We have engineers. Good. All right, so we've got our broad talk. When I'm talking about evidence, I don't mean evidence about whether or not the engineer in a particular device saves a particular amount of energy under control conditions or water efficiency technology. I'm not talking about trends and status of indicators of the biosphere, how much greenhouse gas emissions were emitting, what the land cover looks like, what the nutrients look like in the water. Because these things that we care about, these status and trends that we're trying to change, the only way we can change them are through policies and programs. They don't miraculously change. And what we're really lacking in terms of evidence is evidence of the impacts of the things we're doing to try to change the status and trends of these indicators. Right? We spend a huge amount of work monitoring elephant populations, endangered species, greenhouse gas emissions, quality of the water, quantity of the water, but not as much effort going into figuring out is what we're doing to change these indicators. Doing it, is it doing it in a desired way, through what moderators or what mechanisms, in order that we can improve our ability uh, to, to uh, uh, achieve what we're trying to achieve in the environmental arena. And so this is my first time pressing let's see what happens. Because we have all these policies. Now, I don't want to minimize the politics and preferences in terms of environmental debates, but even among people who all are trying to achieve the same environmental objectives, there's incredible amounts of debate about what we're doing and how effective it is. And so I put up one Endangered Species Act, you can look at some of the quotes, but even among people who support the Endangered Species Act, over 40 years old, we still have diametrically opposed opinions about its effectiveness. We have people saying that it's 99.9% .9 effective uh, and it's the most critical piece of thing that we have. It's stopped extinctions. We cannot mess with it at all. We have people on the other side saying that's all garbage. It's not doing anything. Or it's even doing worse. It's forcing landowners to preemptively degrade their habitats to keep those regulations off of themselves. How can it be 40 years after we've had this policy, all this effort that goes into monitoring these species, we still have these diametrically opposed debates. It's not just politics. It's because we're not generating the kind of evidence that we ought to be. We're not asking the right questions. And, and it's important right, to have this evidence because environmental problems are human problems. They're not chemical problems. They're not hydrology problems. They're not engineering problems. They're human problems. And without credible evidence how humans respond to environmental policies, we're not going to be able to solve these problems. I know this is not news to people. I know people have been talking about humans all day. Right? So I've got a hydrology model, and in that model, there are humans down at the bottom. These agricultural water use, irrigation efficiency, 
cultivated acreage, water demand by crop type. <coughs> problems that we have is that the way in which humans are modeled in a lot of these systems is incredibly stylized, coarse, or hopeful. That they're going to behave like we want them to behave. And humans don't. They're a pain in the ass. They don't do what we want to do. They keep changing. We give them some great new technology and they don't use it the way they were supposed to use it. Right? The way we the controlled conditions. I just want to give you a concrete example. Right, this is a big deal in Georgia, the southeast, we've got the water wars, and what do we do to try to promote uh, water stewardship? Now, it would be great if we actually charge the price that was appropriate for the scarcity, but we don't. So one of the big things is we try to improve efficiency. We do this in lots of domains, in energy, and, and chemical use, and import, uh, input use. Right, so let's just say we've got a new irrigation technology, it doesn't have to be these drop nozzles. But let's just say it's just a technology uses 20% 20, 20 less water than current technology according to the engineers. Right? So the logic usually goes, so let's encourage people to adopt it and water use will decline by 20%. I understand people do this with energy, lots of situations. And the problem is, is that people don't just take these technologies. I think it was, was it you this morning talked about innovation or adaptation. People don't use technologies in the way that uh, you normally know, think of them to do. The people aren't static. They change. They don't just keep doing what they're doing and they add this technology. They say, oh, I got this new technology. What else can I change in my operations to make myself more effective? We do this all the time. We have a software program that cuts our programming time or our optimization time in half. We don't just sit them that, that save time learning how to whistle in our office. Hey, we, we use that to be more productive. We invest in other activities. Right, so in this particular technology, we've got a picture of drop nozzle of irrigation. We spent over $20 million in Georgia promoting the adoption of this technology based on an untested assumption in the field that this reduces water use. I, I only have one good study, this particular study I put up here, that tried to credibly disentangle the effect of the irrigation technology adoption from the characteristics of the kinds of farmers that adopt these technologies. So they had repeated observations of the same farmers in Kansas over time, some of which adopt the technology, some of which don't. They try to eliminate confounding variables. Right? And they find it actually increased water use. And a good part of the study, they looked at the mechanisms. They showed that those who were adopting it were expanding their wetted acreage and they were changing their crop mix and the crop varieties to more water demanding crops. So yes, it saved technology, it just stayed the static and they didn't change. But they did change and actually the opposite of the intended effect. All right, now this is just one study, one place, it doesn't mean this is going to happen all over the place. So the main question is, do programs aimed at encouraging technology adoption and changes in practice Reduce water use in the right places at the right times in the right way. You can't assume this. You've got to actually look at this carefully, test this carefully under naturally occurring conditions. The evidence is really weak, and not just in this domain, in every domain. We've got all this toolkit that we talked about information and messaging and incentives and regulations and decentralization and devolution. The evidence base is incredibly weak. I mean, by evidence that we actually have credible, credible empirical evidence that stands up the modern standards for empirical design about whether these things work in the way in which we think they work. And I don't have all the presentation to convince you of that. A lot of you don't necessarily believe that. In fact, I was nominated for this fellowship and had this panel that evaluated the candidates, and, and I get the responses back. And one of the panelists said, Ferrar was just wrong. So we have all the evidence we need. We just don't communicate it effectively to decision makers. We don't need more evidence. We need work on uh, communication. I don't believe that. I'm not sure, if you do believe that, I'm not sure how I'm going to convince you, but let me give you a couple of pieces of evidence. So in medicine, they have something called the Cochrane Collaboration. The Cochrane Collaboration focuses on systematic reviews of the evidence base to try to figure out what do we know about different medical treatments, drugs, practices. And importantly, they don't do literature reviews. A systematic review looks at the quality of the evidence and eliminates things that they don't believe are high quality. And particularly those that don't get rid of confounding variables, 
bias associated with who gets exposed to a particular drug or treatment, and is correlated with the health outcomes themselves. They want to eliminate these rival explanations that might mimic or mask correlations between a treatment and an outcome. I, we now have something like that in the environment. It's called the Collaboration for Environmental Evidence, and a new journal that publishes the systematic reviews. I'm a senior editor of this journal, and I found one important theme that keeps coming out of the systematic reviews. People have looked at all sorts of things in the environment, trying to figure out what do we know about the impacts of these particular kinds of interventions. And the theme is, we don't know much. Can't figure it out. That the evidence out there Community-based forest management, hundreds of articles. A recent systematic review says most of them are not worth anything for inferring whether community forest management actually changes practices in, in, in a desirable way and what are the moderators and mechanisms of that. Uh, and so there's a couple of choice of quotes up here. The general problem is that the designs we're using don't stand up to scrutiny in terms of when people look at do they have the hallmarks the features of uh, modern empirical analysis looking at impacts. And so you think, well, how can that be? There's, there's hundreds and thousands of studies out there on all these things that we're doing. And what we have out there is largely a mix of what practitioners are doing, which are called learning by doing. Well, they do all these policies and programs, and education programs, incentive programs, and technology adoption programs, and then they sort of eyeball. Right? They might do a survey, they might do a case study analysis. Those are good for hypothesis generation, for thinking about implementation, but they're lousy for trying to actually figure out what's going on. It's like taking medicine and then trying to figure out two days later, did they help you or not? It's really hard to do that, sort of learn by doing. And then the scientists largely are engaged in monitoring exercises, monitoring the status and trends of indicators. Right? We're great at monitoring. What's going on with methane? What's going on with carbon dioxide? What's the phosphorus loading going on in the Chesapeake? Is that Chesapeake? Well, Chesapeake, or it could be in the Mississippi. Is it contributing to hypoxia? That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about impact evaluation. Oops. I'm talking about attributing changes in the status and trends of these indicators to a policy or program intervention separate from other factors. That's what I'm talking about in terms of generating evidence. So say an indicator is going up, is it because of what we're doing and what exactly are we doing to make it go up? If it's going down, is it, would it have been worse or better without our intervention? It's called attribution, or a way to think about it is causal inferences, looking for causal relationships. And we're terrible at that. Right? There's been a revolution in causal inference in the last two decades in terms of how do we infer causal relation, X causes Y, from data and untestable assumptions, and particularly from observational data, non-experimental data, which is often what we're dealing with in the environmental <coughs> context. Right? This revolution, this is a bunch of some of the most recent books out that sort of summarize what's going on, has been completely ignored by the environmental field. Right? So if I throw up words like surrogate variables or instrumental variable designs or regression discontinuity designs or individual fixed effect panel data designs, matching designs, if those don't sound familiar to you, then you're part of the group that's missing out on this really important design revolution to how we draw causal inferences from data, particularly non-experimental data. And again, this is not a method seminar. That's not what I want to do here. But I want to just highlight just a couple of key features. One is that design is the most important. I know teachers reinforce this in graduate programs, but somehow we all get methods oriented. When I look at the environmental literature, it's particularly method-oriented. We've got Bayesian, multi-level multi -level hierarchical analysis. All these things really focused on essentially the standard essence of the standard errors. Right? What I'm focusing on is this idea of I've seen patterns in the data out there, and I try to disentangle them so I can say X is causing Y separate from other factors. And that's a design effort. And there's been a lot of effort going to create a design to be able to draw those inferences out there in the literature. This is number two. And in particular, testing for hidden bias. Because any kind of empirical analysis rests on data and untestable assumptions. And we never really interrogate these untestable assumptions very well in the environmental arena. You've never heard of sensitivity tests, tests of known effects, partial identification. These are all these techniques that people have been pushing in. State of the art, a 
analyses of causal impacts are required to have these sorts of uh, features to interrogate the assumptions and see is this really a real relationship or just something spurious. And then the last one, clarifying the assumptions, making them really clear. If you actually made the assumptions really clear in some of the most highly cited articles in the environmental field about impacts of the policies and programs we're doing, they'd be laughable, right? But they're not made transparent. That makes it also hard for us to uh, learn from the literature. Okay. So I don't know if you're paying attention. You're doing a good job of these facing forward. That's good. <laughs> this is the slot. Okay, if you're not going to pay attention to me, this is where I take out the pen for the t-shirts that blow for that laser. <laughs> if you pay attention, this is the slide I want you to take home. All right? The key question for us to look great in money what is actually happening and measuring it with a huge amount of effort. But what we need to be thinking about is what would have happened in the absence of what we're doing, right? Policies and programs. What would have happened in the absence of a messaging program or a technology adoption program or an effort to bring in minority forest owners into these particular forest management programs? And how different would social and environmental conditions have been in the absence of the program? This is called a counterfactual, counterfactual condition, contrary to fact. This is what people in fields that are far more advanced in the environment do, are focused all their efforts on when they're trying to generate evidence about various interventions. Right? The counterfactual condition. If you're not spending almost all your effort on that, right, it's the hardest part. I see what elephant populations are with our ivory band. What would they have been like in the absence of the ivory band? This is hard to do, and I'm not talking about simulation. We do simulations, but the problem with simulations, I've done these myself, is that, again, we have kind of that stylized, simplistic, often hopeful uh, version of human behavior. We need to draw from observable data. And the more we draw from observable data, try to use observable data to estimate these counterfactual conditions, the better. And we don't do that. Our top analysis, our top journals, would never be considered credible in other fields. Right, so let's just take a step back. I want you to imagine a public health impact analysis, right? So we would imagine a global public health actions to address a particular rare illness. It doesn't matter what the illness is. Right, so this is how they go about trying to measure the effect of all these health actions addressed for this illness. Is they take 920 people, sample, that have the illness, and we have data on their health status over time, right? 864 of the people, their health status deteriorates over time. 64 people are stable or better over time. All right? This study then assumes that the 64 people who are stable or better would not improve in the absence of actions. All right? And then they argue the difference between the two measures, meaning the measure that we actually see they're stable or better versus the one where they wouldn't have changed at all in the absence of actions, can be attributed to public health actions. And then we further can that this estimate of the impacts of global public health actions uh, underestimates the impact of public actions because it doesn't account for people that would have deteriorated further in the absence of public health actions, right? uh, and or improve while not enough to change health status measures. The measure might be coarse. And so I see a lot of you scrunching up your forehead. I don't get that. I've done the scrunching. It won't help you understand this study. It doesn't make any sense. In fact, it's imposing the counterfactual to the 64 people. It says, take these 64 people that we know got better because of the action, and let's imagine that they wouldn't have gotten better. That's our counterfactual. Right? And what about all the 9 and the 64 that deteriorate? Those are sort of ignored. Right? Change the words, put people change into species, change illness X to endangerment, change health status to a uh, red list index, and change global public health actions to global conservation actions. And those things in quotes are lifted from this article. Right? So I don't know, 500 times from science, top journal, if you're not familiar with it, impact of conservation of the status of the world's vertebrates. That, I mean, it's not just an article. It's an article in the best journal, and most of the best articles on conservation should be in these journals. Has a counterfactual. Most analyses do, they're, they're either imposed, like this one, or they're implicit. So here's another.
another one from a study in Nature by Bill Lawrence and others, where they looked at protected areas, reserves, tropical forest areas, and they monitored a bunch of indicators. Right? So there's lots of people on the start of they do a lot of data. And any protected areas that were stable or improved over time, they were considered effective reserves. They were classified as effective. Any reserves that saw a decline in their indicators were considered poorly performing or ineffective. And so, but what if I told you that the reserves, the half of the reserves with staple indicator values, that's what they found, about half were passable or effective. What if I told you that their indicator values, they would have been better in the absence of the reserves? They're actually lower in the presence of the reserves. And the rest of them, those with declining values, they would have been even worse had they not been in the reserves. Right? So those with the staple were better, they actually would have been higher had they not been reserves. And those with the declining, they would have been even lower. Which ones are the effective reserves then? It's the ones with the declining indicators. That they, they actually had an impact. The ones with the improving indicators, they actually made things worse. Now I'm not saying that's what happened. What I'm saying is the article never actually looks at, thinks about the counterfactual, what would have happened, and it simply implicitly imposes it. We know that those that went up, they would have been worse. And had they been better managed, those protected areas went down, they would have been better off. Again, counterfactual, sort of by assertion rather than by the data. And it matters. It can matter hugely to our conclusions. So I want you to ignore the one in the right-hand corner. I decided I'm not going to talk about that article. Look at the left-hand figure. Now, this is a study that looked at the impact of protected areas in Costa Rica on avoided deforestation. So it's in percentage terms, in terms of the percent of forest protected, and in hectares, hundreds of thousands of hectares. Below the black line are all the traditional methods for estimating the impacts of protected areas on avoided deforestation. So this is stuff that you find in science nature, proceedings of national county of science, using past trends to establish the future trend, doing inside-outside comparison, look at protected areas versus unprotected areas, deforestation trends, without controlling for the fact that before is not a perfect predictor of the past, things change over time, and that things that are outside protected areas are fundamentally different in terms of their characteristics that affect land use than things that are inside protected areas. When you ignore all that, and you use the stuff, the estimators that are in the top journals below the black bar, you see that the protected areas, the amount of avoided deforestation, is anywhere from a quarter to a half of the forest protected. It's over a long time period, 60 to 97. But if you say, okay, wait a minute, let's, let's compare things that were forested in the 60s that didn't get protected, that have similar characteristics to the things that got protected in terms of the agricultural suitability and the nature of the population and how far they are from roads and infrastructure. Things that affect deforestation that are also correlated with where protection gets placed. So we're comparing apples to apples a little bit better. That's above the black line. Look how dramatically different the estimate is. It's less than 10% of the area protected would have been deforested in the absence. It all comes down to how do you estimate the counterfactual? How much thought did you put into estimating the counterfactual? I don't want to say the thing above the bar is correct and the other things are false. Although I believe that things above the bar are better and things below are worse. But the key thing is that it matters hugely how you go about characterizing the counterfactual and think about an impact. The impact is nothing more than what we see, the difference between what we see and what would have happened had we not done the intervention. When they do drug trials, randomized control trials, why do they have a control? Because it represents the counterfactual. What would happen to these people's health had they not been exposed to the treatment or the drug? Right? An observation was done if they go find that control, that counterfactual. No, I have to do some manipulations to do it, but it's important that we do so. Because we can get very different answers. Right? It doesn't have to be just that we were overestimating the impact. Sometimes you get qualitatively completely different uh, conclusions. So here's a study again from Costa Rica. Don't worry about the Thailand one. Let's look at the impact of protected areas on poverty in the local communities around protected areas. Big debate on conservation science of where these protected areas, these fortresses, 
are immiserating the people that live around them by denying them access to resources. Right? If you go to look at the World Wildlife Fund, they got all these pictures of Conservation International, smiling villages who are doing tourism and making baskets, and they're better off because of tourism. Right? This debate is one of these debates that persists decade after decade because the evidence is just not very good. Everybody has these little anecdotes and case studies and simulations that show that they're worse off or they're better off as a result. Right, so this is using observable data. Right, so the one on the right hand side, all you need to know is that it's measure of poverty as an asset index. The positive numbers mean that the protected areas are exacerbating poverty. The negative numbers mean it's alleviating poverty. The dark bars, what you do, and this has been done in top journals where they compare changes in poverty for those who live near protected areas to changes in other rural areas that are not near protected areas. Without controlling the fact that these guys may have a completely different at baseline. They don't put protected areas randomly across the landscape. Where do they put them? They tend to put them where the people who can't bite them off go. People that are the farthest away from infrastructure, that's where the forest still is. People that don't have a huge amount of economic potential in the first place. When you do that comparison, it looks like protected areas really exacerbate poverty, right? Which is consistent with one of the arguments, the anti protected area. Um, argument. But when you say, hey, wait a minute, look at those areas. If you go back to before protected areas were even established, these areas were already poor than all the other rural areas on average. They were farther from roads. They had worse agricultural land. They were farther from markets. Those are rival explanations for that difference that we see in that dark blue bar. What if we matched them so that they, at least at the beginning they were very similar in terms of their potential to grow economically? Compare apples to apples. When you do that, if the light bars, don't worry about the difference between matching and matching and calipers, the punchline there, the point is, is that we get the opposite conclusion that those areas who got protection placed near them are actually a little better off than those areas that didn't get protection. They all started roughly similar in terms of their poverty, agricultural potential, and things like that. So the point is, not again to point out this, this is reality, but it makes a huge difference that we spend very little time in the environmental arena, thinking carefully about that counterfactual. All right, so this is not a methods class. But I want to talk about one particular method, and Nate mentioned this, this section that we have now at Georgia State. Because there's one method that most of you know, particularly if you're in the science field. Right? But you don't necessarily think of it as something that you would use to test policies, and that's experimental design. I mean, we know about experiments with fields, crops, soils, those things. Engineers use experiments to see whether the technology works over time. We're not using experiments much in policy, but there's no reason we have these new policies and new uh, ideas. I mean, all morning I just hear hypotheses about how we can do better messaging and how we can get people engaged in programs and change their behavior and get them to do something differently. These are hypotheses that can be tested in an experimental design. And we, lots of other social policy fields are doing this more and more, and the environment are not doing much of this. But we have a new program, a policy, or a tweak of an old one. I was in this meeting for Endangered Species Act with the Department of Interior and then Home Builders Association, the Farm Bureau, all this sort of anti-ESA. And they were talking about voluntary programs for endangered species. And the Department of Interior said, nobody's signing up for these voluntary programs. What's going on with you guys? And the home builder said, we'll sign up for it, the Farm Bureau, but there's too many legal requirements, too much paperwork. And then the Department of Interior said, well, if we don't have all that legal requirement in the paperwork, you guys won't do what you're supposed to do. Right? There is sort of a stalemate. And what I said is, well, let's test that idea. Let's randomly reduce the paperwork for some landowners and not for others, a pilot program, and see what happens on their land. Trader versus control group. And this new center, which is a mouthful, I often trip over trying to say it as well, but see there, is trying to do that. USDA allocated money because they're getting pressure. All the federal agencies are getting pressure from the Obama administration through this what's called the Evidence and Innovation Agenda. And the OMB is pushing the agencies to show, demonstrate evidence that what they're doing actually works. And there's three laggards that have been identified by the OMB, the federal agencies. EPA, USDA and Department of Interior, all environmental related agencies that are fighting. So now USDA has finally said, we want to do something about this. We want to have behavioral scientists giving some insight into how we can 
better run these programs or create new programs, and then we want to test them in randomized controlled trials or experimental design. So you don't have to run pure randomized controlled trials at perfect compliance like you get in drug trials. There's lots of creative ways to create variation in who gets exposed to a program, who doesn't, allows us, the analysts, to draw inferences about whether a program is working the way it's intended and whether the moderators and impacts. And the idea is to foster a culture of this at the USDA, but we're looking for partners who are working in programs or have access to partners who have a hypothesis how we can make things better and are interested or willing to test the hypothesis on new carefully controlled conditions. Just when I mean control, I don't mean laboratory. All I mean is that we're controlling who gets exposed to a program and who doesn't. Right, so that's not just the people who are already environmentally interested who sign up for the program, and those who don't, the people that hate the environment. If you compare them, you get dramatic effects from the program. They're not coming from the program, they're coming from characteristics of the people that are different. And then for those of you who are modelers, we're also interested in partnerships, because in your models you have humans typically. They're changing land use, they're changing their water use, they're changing their energy use. But where are those parameterizations coming from? They're usually not coming from empirical data, but from stylized facts or your own gut or some assumptions. What we want to do is there's lots of things where we can measure behavioral changes, right? Changes in energy use, changes in nutrient management, changes in water use, but the, the broader landscape impacts, you can't observe easily in an experiment. It needs to go into a model. So, but we're interested in using the data coming from our experience to parameterize these larger coupled human natural systems model to get the impacts on the broader landscape or airshed or watershed that one might be interested in doing. Right? These experiments are already being run. There's very few of them in the environment, but they are being run now. So this is an example from Central America. Two experiments, one testing whether getting people to adopt water efficiency technology actually reduces water use at the right times and in the right way. And then the one on the left might be interesting to you because all the scientists, me included, have this belief that evidence matters. And if you get them the scientific evidence, it actually changes something. But you know what? There's no evidence about the value of evidence. In fact, if you talk to people, people say hey, this doesn't matter in any political debate or any program design. I don't think I think that's a little bit too extreme, but we're going with a particular climate change adaptation project. It's very standard. You've got the climate modelers modeling the scenarios, you've got social scientists in the field trying to figure out best practices and best responses. And then what do they do at the end? They do a dissemination where they give out this valuable information to all the stakeholders and decision makers. And then they say, see what they're going to change. We're going to actually run the dissemination as a randomized controlled trial with water, local water institutions to see if the scientific information matters and different ways of delivering that information are more likely to lead them to actually take on uh, adaptation measures as measured by a bunch of indicators. And even here in Atlanta or in Georgia, I'm not Atlanta, in Georgia, during the drought, right? People were trying to messaging earlier in the day. So during the drought in 2007, we were supposed to push residential and commercial users to voluntarily restrict their water use. So there's odd even days, but there's also this campaign that pe people needed to use water wisely, contribute to the public good, do what you can, every drop counts, that sort of stuff. And we got Cobb County to say, well, we don't know what messages actually work, uh, what the relative differences are, how long they persist over time. So before you just go out and blanket everybody with, with a message, why don't we try different messages and see how well they work. We'll actually look at the differences between people who get the message at random and people who don't get the message at random in terms of their water use over time. So we have three messages. One that just gave people technology ideas, like how do you turn off the water when you're not brushing your teeth, technology you can install, how to check the leaks, how to water your lawn properly. So the how of water conservation. Another group got the how plus the why. It was the moral plea. Please, we've got a drought, you need to do your part. Everybody, please contribute. They had a bunch of the language about use water wisely, every drop counts, that sort of stuff. And the third message added what psychologists call the social comparison. That people want to know what other people are doing. How it's a social norm. You try to establish a norm, and then people will get on board with water conservation. Uh, and so we did that during the highway drought in the summer of 2007. May 2007, we sent out a message, just one message. 
wasn't like the key message, it was just a letter. And when you look at the impacts, this is like compared to the control group. So the people that got the information on the tips, right, how do you reduce water use, barely anything, less than one and a half a percent. It's not statistically different from zero. People that got the information and the moral pitch, please do your part, they actually reduce water use by two and a half percent compared to the uh, control group. And the group that got the social comparison doubled that rate five percent. Right? You might think that's not, you know, that's not that big, but it's a single letter. That is pretty big. And typically what gets sent out is the info only. You get it in your bill, you get it in the messages they tell you about how the different things you can do to reduce your water use. That's not very effective. But coupling with these other techniques from psychology seem to be effective. And then we can look at the persistence of these impacts. Right? We can look over time. Again, comparing the control group to the treatment group. The moral suasion, it was done within three months. Right? We still had a drought three months later. If you remember for that in October of that year, we actually banned all outdoor water use. It was gone and we never saw it again. Whereas those who got the social comparison, something permanent changed. That six years later, we still see they use water differently than other people. They use less water than the control group that didn't get the message. I this is one place, one time period, it doesn't prove anything, but this is the source that we can do when we're rolling out programs. Think about how we might be able to do them to generate evidence about what's going on. Then we look at this and say, well, how did they change their water use? So this indoor water use, that's not going to help the trout very much, that water often goes back into the system. But if it's outdoor consumptive water use, that would be really important. And actually what we find is that's where a lot of the water use reduction is coming from. So thinking about the mechanisms, Who's most likely to reduce their water? One thing people hate about price as a way to get people to conserve is it hurts the poor, right? And the rich don't bother changing because they have a lot of money. In this experiment, the most responsive households were the rich, right? They were the ones that respond to the social norm messages. So that's also interesting, right? The evidence that might help us out of some of these debates. All right, so we're interested in this sort of experimental design. We'll learn more about it. A good starting place in the environment context is something I wrote for the Global Environment Facility when I'm a science advisor there. Uh, it's online on the web. And do I have like five minutes or not really? Because we're a little bit behind. Yeah, Let me just say the last one, right? Because stop again. Okay, so it works on average, right? Does that sound okay? Well, one place, Cobb County in Georgia, will it work in Athens? Will it work in Mississippi? Will it work in Malawi? Will it work in South Africa? Right? To get understand that, we need to understand the moderators and the mechanisms. We need to go farther. We need to get inside the black box. Right? What I'm talking about mostly is here's a program, there's the outcome, there's all these confounding variables. How do we go about eliminating them? We've got to be doing that. But there's still the problem. They have this problem in medicine. Okay, it works on average, reduces water use by 10% or energy use by 13% and deforestation by 20%. How? And the how matters when we're thinking about environment and social consequences of these policies and programs. And this is something we do hardly at all in the environmental sphere. And when we do it, we do it really, really poorly. All right, so I'll just end with this. This is from Science. I know these authors are working together, so I can criticize them. I feel better about it than I did in the other articles. But they were looking at community management of forests. And they were trying to figure out what made for success. And what they did is they said, okay, we've got these outcomes that we're measuring in terms of social environmental outcomes, and we're going to do a regression of those on forest size, rulemaking participation, and commercial livelihoods. The problem with that is that we're mixing a bunch of things here. So the previous slide is something called moderators and mechanisms. You don't need to worry about the definition, but there are some things that the program actually affects. Those are mechanisms. Right? I come in and I put in a protected area, it increases tourism opportunities, that makes the people better off. That's a mechanism. Right? A moderator is rich people respond more to poor people. My program may not be changing that, but that's the that moderates the effect. And it's got forest size, which is a moderator, rulemaking participation, which is a, a part of the program itself, it's a component of the program, and commercial livelihoods, whether or not people became more or less dependent on the forest for commercial activity, which is a mechanism, all in one equation. Right? Again, I'm not going into methods, but that's bad. 
right? That's just, you, you can't do this. And this is in science. And this article 2011, I think it is, 2011, is already cited almost 200 times. Right? So I encourage you to move beyond average impacts and look at mechanisms and moderators, but to, to caution you that, again, there's been this revolution in how we do empirical work the last 20 years. This is not the way we do it. Right? This would not pass in other fields, and it shouldn't pass in our field. Uh, and there's lots of talent out here, and I hear a lot of things going on that we amenable to these sorts of things. And I hope to see a lot of your publication and your practice and impacts uh, coming out in the near future. Thanks for your time. We certainly have a few minutes for questions before we uh, move on to the reception. Yes. Um, with some of the environmental issues, the, the problem is to get that, that, that policy effect is a time scale issue. It mm. takes a long time yeah. to see effects. How would you recommend the things that are uh, that? Great might question. Right? But this is not unique. George, you think about cancer. That happens over a long period of time. Right? So we have, we have issues of time scale and spatial scale. We've got large watersheds and oceans and uh, airships. So, so we have difficulties, but other fields also have these same difficulties. And what gets done is a combination of first having an elaborate causal model that lays out the intermediate steps, and we look at the intermediate steps. Right? And the first thing that has to happen is people have to change their behavior. Farmers, people don't change their behavior. Commercial firms will not get the follow on outcome. And so we're looking for those intermediate changes, you're using modeling, right, that might have those in the, in the model, and then it's waiting, right, so like in the water thing, we gotta wait six years to find out what happens six years after the program, and do that in health, they've got experiments they did in the 50s, they've documented they're still exploiting the data now, right, to figure out what happens in the long term, so it is a really, it's, a, it's an obstacle, but it's not an excuse for not working on these issues, so it's a great, uh, great point. Environmentalism, the weird thing is we've got this combination of the most typical arena for looking at impact because of these issues of the scale at which we do it, the time scale, and the lags involved, and we're using the most rudimentary methods available for that thing. So we've got this complete mismatch of really complicated situations to, to do empirical analysis and we're using really rudimentary designs. Yes. I just, uh, you know, when, when, I, when I hear the whole talk, I, what I'm thinking of is, is, uh, is confounding. Mm -hmm. you know, that we're having a problem separating the family. But I, I mean, I do want to kind of make the claim that at least in the environmental education programs I'm familiar with, our students do uh, hear, uh, you know, lessons on confounding and how to, uh, how to deal with it. For example, the, the back use. It's something that you know that they're taught uh, in experimental design class. And I think there's an understanding of the match case control uh, kind of kind of studies. And uh, and then on the on the implementation, and we also talk about adaptive management, which is mm. uh, you know model based uh, decision making where alternative hypotheses are proposed, right. and, and the data are, are, are then used to assess uh, assess the relevant. Right. right. So some of it is coming through, I think, in our, in our education. So, so let me think of two pieces, uh, the back end design and the things that we're doing. So back end, for those who don't know, is before-after control intervention, before-after control impact design, where you've got treatment and control group or groups, and you see before and you see after. You take the different, the economists call this difference and difference, and political scientists call it. And the idea is that it's a powerful design because what you're assuming is that the trend of the control, the comparison group not exposed, is a counterfactual trend for the group that's exposed to it. So the difference in their trends and their slopes gives you an idea of the impact of the program on the change, whatever indicator you're looking at. So, so uh, on one hand, people are using it, but there's two issues. So I did a review of marine protected area impact analysis. 
only a tiny, tiny fraction use that design. So it's, most stuff doesn't even use that. And that design is so problematic in the sense that when they use it, they don't explain why are some units exposed to this program and others not. Why would they believe that the trend of the comparison group is the trend of the tree group in the absence of tree? Why would I believe it's the counterfactual? That's a really strong assumption. In fact, in economics, that assumption is generally criticized. Isn't it? Why would you think that people exposed to an environmental education program and people not exposed will have the same trends in the absence of exposure? So I agree with that. Right? Huh? Well, see, but not just randomization. Thinking about the selection process, good causal studies, good impact evaluation, the first thing they ask is, why are some people, species, areas, water rights exposed to this policy program and others are not? That's what we mean by where the confounding variables are coming from. The people who go into the environmental education program are already environmentally oriented. They're already doing a lot to change their behaviors in their household. So I've got to disentangle interest in environmental activities from the program, the education program itself. So it doesn't have to be randomization. Randomization makes up to think about those confounders. If I don't have randomization, I have to think really hard about them. And we don't do that. So you know, the most advanced design is that we use very little, but even that is considered really uh, implausible in lots of situations. And adaptive management, if we actually did adaptive management like the scholars talk about adaptive management, then I agree, we'd be doing these experimentation, bringing it in, adapting what we do, and constantly be experimenting, learning, and adapting. But adaptive management is taken on the, this vague essence for practitioners of these. We do, we stand back, we look at it, we learn from it, and we change. Right, so it's not, I know mean, you're doing decision analysis, you're doing it in a very formal way, but, but that word has taken on a very vague meaning in terms of in practice. But I agree, in practice, you still need an adaptive measure way to actually learn effectively. And so this stuff will fit into that. This is just this like, once I've learned something, now what do I do? I don't need to bring that information in and adapt to continue the test. Yes. I have a question about the Cobb County uh -huh. So when you found out that information, I think you might have said that it's not generalizable. Like no, I said I'm not going to say generalizable okay. because it's, it's, it's a pretty bad drought. It's Cobb County, very unique county. Um, but yes. So my yeah. question is, well, then what do we do with that? Right. So this is, I mean, again, this is not, it's an obstacle, right? We need more of those experiments. Yeah. There are water utilities all over the world who are interested in demand management. They can all run experiments on a variety of their programs. Right? Energy utilities are increasingly doing that now. Right? When the regulators are, are giving them a nudge to do so, they don't do it on their own if they don't want to reduce the next and critical key pricing. But you need to do it in more places. But ultimately, it's like in medicine. I mean, I can't tell for a particular individual if this medicine is going to work. I can only know on average what's it works or not. And on what I want to figure out for subgroups, women versus men, black versus white, these sorts of things. But ultimately, policy is a blunt tool. We like to know what works on average. I would never send my son to a school where it's an average, makes the kids dumber. But there is 10% where they become brilliant, but we don't can't identify it in advance. Right? I'd rather send my kids to a school where, on average, this is going to be beneficial. So that's the problem with, with this. We need to do more of this work because you can't just have one study in one area and that's how we design national policy based on that. But understanding the moderators and mechanisms and trying to figure out is there anything unique about this particular site that we can carry over, that's an important exercise uh, to do. Yes? It uh, seems that the um, broader the spatial or governance scale, the harder it is to experiment. For instance, it would be hard to have an experimental carbon tax or right. cap and trade system. That's right. So how do you scale up to these larger, larger environmental right. problems like ocean acidification or something right. like that? So I mean, a lot of this is again, experimentation. We have implicit causal models that behind a carbon tax or behind something we might be doing runoff and nutrient management. So the first thing is to elaborate that causal model and then do what they call mechanism experiments, testing pieces of that causal model through experimentation to see if the world works the way we actually think it works. So an example, I've got a colleague in Atlanta, we're talking about uh, 
doing dynamic pricing for driving to reduce traffic and idling. It's hard to do that as a randomized control trial. But what they're doing is they're random, they're basically down people at random with money that they take away. They put something in their car, they take away the money from them if they drive during a particular time. So they're facing a price now. Right? The experimenters are giving them a price, and it's for a persistent period of time, and they're going to see if the prices change their behavior like we think in a desirable way, seeing exactly how does it change it, how does it depend upon the price. Right? It's still sort of artificial because you'd hope that if, it was, if people thought it was going to be permanent, they might make other capital investments uh, that would change what they thought it was going to be year long. They might. That's like the first step. I mean, they've done this in, in criminology when they want to test uh, hot spots. In, uh, um, what's the place? Broken windows hypothesis. This idea you crack down on low probability, uh, low uh, intensity crimes like graffiti and vandalism and jaywalking and littering. And somehow that affects the high probability of crimes. They're actually running experiments with police departments and tested, but in the beginning, all they did with these experiments was they randomly cleaned up areas and not other areas. So they didn't crack down, but they said if you clean up the area, reduce the amount of disorder. That was the hypothesis. That we'll see fewer crimes. And then they monitor other crimes, not murders, because those don't happen very often, but other crimes like littering, and you see if the sense of order did affect people's behavior, and it did. So it doesn't prove that broken windows like doing this kind of policing where you crack down on litterers and vandalism and graffiti artists is going to change the murder rate in New York City. But it's a first step towards saying, yeah, this causal model is plausible. When we do this experimentation with various features of this causal model, it seems to play out. Or it might be the opposite, it doesn't. So a woman did a study with compact fluorescent light bulbs in Kazakhstan. And uh, she basically gave people free light bulbs. That's not going to happen in reality. But she gave people free compact fluorescent light bulb and to see, at random, to see how it changed energy use in their household. And she found it increased their energy use. Why is that? She's not positive it's happening during the winter. She thinks because those, those light bulbs aren't giving off heat. So, in order to compensate, people start using more oil uh, for heating. But again, it's just sort of getting at these mechanisms. Before we go and ban and incandescent and, and force people to use compact fluorescence, for example, it'd be good to do some of these mechanisms. Like just make sure people's behavior actually looks like what we think it is in our implicit model of reality. So, still looking at this is great. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I think I will uh, close it now and, and thank Paul again for, thank everyone for.